Welcome everyone. So good to have you here this morning. Thankful that you have a chance to join us because we have one of our great heroes. Delighted to have Al Rounds with us. He is amazing. His artwork is amazing. It's influenced people throughout the world and maybe some of you are familiar with his work. We love it. We have his artwork in our home and we'll show you our favorite maybe sometime if we have time. One of our favorites. <laughs> one of our very favorites, the one that's in our family room. But thank you for being with us today, Al. I I just am astounded that you have time in your busy schedule and that you would do this for us. So thank you. Well, let's share with some of you a little bio about Al so you know more about his yeah. background. I, oh, before we start, though, I, I'm sure maybe you've noticed this shiner. And I want you to know that I am not beating up my husband. <laughs> <laughs> he just had a construction accident. And he, he's, yeah, he's looking really good today. <laughs> One of those beautiful blessings where it missed my eyes. So I'm very, yes, very thankful. We are very grateful. So let's talk about Al. I, I just love the write-up that is on his website. And one of the things that it talks about is that he can't even remember a time when he didn't want to be an artist. And when he was young and in school, everybody else was working busily on, on their projects. And he would be daydreaming, looking out the window, deciding what he could draw. I love that. It's and even in church, he had to wait till <laughs> after the sacrament to start to draw. It really didn't make it that far, usually. Uh, another thing that I just loved in that bio is that it says he has a particular reverence for the pride of a place. And he travels to those places that he paints and learns. And we'll learn more about his process. But I just think that is beautiful. Um, he began his college education at... Dixie College. Which you'd never heard of before because he's from <laughs> California. <laughs> right. <laughs> but ended up there with some encouragement from others. And then finished up at the University of Utah. And he's got some wonderful mentors that helped him along the way. Um, but I just, I love how he is a Utah man now. And he lives near us in Utah. And um, I, I just love how it said in his bio he lives in Utah where pioneer history still crowds the fence lines and farmsteads of every town. And he loves to paint the pioneer story. And we'll hear more about that. So thank you for being with us today, Al. So great to have you here. And thanks for all your dedicated discipleship because it's not just your artwork. The spirit you feel in your heart comes through your work so powerfully. And we have felt that so much. So I invite all of you around the world to just join in and tell us where you're listening from and let us hear about your experience also. And we will get back to you. We would love that. So Al, maybe first of all, <laughs> the process you use to prepare to do your artwork is remarkable. <laughs> As I think about what you do to prepare yourself for these beautiful pieces of art. Would you tell us just a little about that? Sure. You know, every painting starts with a feeling, and it's not always uh, obvious what the painting will be. I will just get a sense of, of something, and I start uh, looking and reading and trying to pay attention to where it's coming from. And sometimes I will just be driving down the road, and uh, I drive past a, a ditch, or something that's beautiful and that that ditch alone will trip this feeling into what I need to do. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so that's amazing. I have to stay active and out and doing and looking and reading and uh, because sometimes even uh, my paintings come from reading a diary or some information mm -hmm. and that starts me on I'm like a, a a dog on a scent when, it, when I'm looking for a painting. I'm, I'm pretty hard to deal with until I'm, you know, until I find find it and I'm working on it. Mm. And and generally, it seems like with the artwork we've talked to you about, you like to go to the actual place, be there, experience the spot, to prepare yourself. Yes, it's really important. Um, when, when I was young, I mean, I was always uh, coloring and drawing 
on everything, like, you know, uh, even ruined my mother's piano, you know, <laughs> my artwork. And uh, so I, I'm always uh, drawing and, and uh, been part of that creative process. But and it's been really frustrating to me. I can't paint from what I see in my head. Um, and, and there's a lot of artists can. They, you know, they can see an image in their head and they can paint from it. So I like to always say, like, if someone says, uh, uh, paint a horse. Now, you both can see a horse in your mind. But could you paint from that? Just seeing that. And I can't either. I have to go find me a horse. And once I'm looking at the horse, and even sometimes touching it, uh, I, I'm able to put it in my painting and you know make it move or put it in the position I want. But I have to go and see something in order to find it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that means sometimes uh, I'll go someplace with a historical painting and uh, the building or the objects are not there anymore. So I make little models of the building or of what I'm doing or horses and, or whatnot. And so that I get, I can look at something and get what's out of my head to paper. Wow. It's just amazing the effort you put forth. And I, I just want to say one word about watercolor. It is the hardest medium I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, every stroke stays permanently on the canvas and or the paper or wherever you put it. And it's just remarkable that you can create such beautiful works in watercolor. I, I just think it's a miracle. And why did you choose this this way to paint and express yourself? What is the story there? Oh, man, watercolor is hateful. <laughs> yeah. When I was in college uh, studying art, Watercolor was the last class you wanted. It was such a difficult medium to conquer. And it's just like you just stayed away from it. But yeah. when I, uh, so my studies in college were oil painting in the figure. And after I graduated from the U, I just headed out painting uh, quite often out here in South Jordan, just painting the farms were out here. And I'd be looking for beautiful things to paint. But I was painting in oil painting, and I was just having to work so hard to uh, to get the paintings out. I was just burning out mm. many hours. So I thought, well, I better go try a watercolor because I could do a, a watercolor in a couple of hours. So I could, you know, get. I had a quota of either two or three paintings a day, and that's <laughs> what I had to do to make a living because I was. Oh. <laughs> for $75 and, you know, 25 was a frame. And uh, so I had to produce just like crazy. And so that's where the watercolor started. At first, I, I didn't care for them at all. But then I, after months, I started to really like them. And uh, if they really fit my personality, I could do them uh, one painting at a time and from start to finish. And so that's where the watercolors came from, just trying to make a living. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so recently we have been talking and you told us about a very unique experience you had with one of your most recent paintings. Um, I don't think we'll pull up the painting until you tell us a little about it, but we'll pull up the, your sketch, which is actually behind you right there. And then tell, tell us a little about the process of what happened with this, because your preparation was amazing, this but also limited. <laughs> the, the most uh, interesting and difficult and fun painting all at once that's ever happened to me. And mm -hmm. It all started in conference when President Nelson was announcing the 200th anniversary of the celebration of the, the first vision. And he said, uh, I want you to go home and come back to the next conference. Uh, he uh, wanted us to prepare for coming. And uh, I turned to Cynthia and I said, boy, I need to finish those two paintings of the Sacred Grove that I've wanted to do for years. 
So uh, I immediately started meeting with the Don Enders, uh, the church historian that was, you know, the expert in the Sacred Grove in that area, Palmyra area. I met with him and we got all the details worked out of the historical aspects because I wanted the paintings to be accurate. And all I needed to do was to get to New York because I can't paint from my head, right? I can sort of see these paintings in my head, but I need to get to New York and that's where I can find the, you know, Trump. And as I come across a certain place, that feeling says, okay, this is, there's your painting. You know, mm. At the connect that. Well, several things happened. I had an emergency surgery I wasn't planning on and then COVID hit and I was not able to travel to New York and I was so frustrated because I felt like I was doing what I should be doing. I'd done all the work behind it and uh, I'd done it prayerfully and done all the things we should have, you know, that we're supposed to do. Yeah. And now I can't do it. And, uh, and then eventually uh, things got better time-wise to go back and uh, Cynthia wouldn't let me get on a plane or she wouldn't let me drive back. I was going to drive back. She goes, no. <laughs> and so um, last July, uh, I had this beautiful dream. It was a very simple dream. It was very clear. And I could see 14-year-old uh, Joseph on his way to the grove. He was standing very still on a grassy knoll. And he had a big floppy hat on, you know, with a big brim. It's all crunched up, and the up and he was looking off in the distance, but he was standing still for me. And I couldn't see too well the upper half of his face; it was all in shadow. You could tell it was early morning because the sun was coming at a horizon, right, level straight at him. And he had on. Uh, I was able to look at him really carefully. So I could paint him, you know, I kept thinking, look at his pants, look at this, look at his eyes, look at his nose. And uh, so his pants were definitely homemade. Uh, they were way too big for him. I could see the corner of a suspender coming out. Uh, I, the, his shirt was big baggy, uh, way too big for him. Mm. Blanket over his shoulders. And it was just sort of clumped on his shoulders like a 14 year old would do you know a 14 year old when you go out the door mom straightens them up <laughs> but zip up your coat right and but this was just on his shoulders like a, a boy would put on his shoulders and of course his hat and uh, i could see the length of his hair his hair seemed long to me and it was not blonde but uh, sort of sandy uh, a sandy light color and uh and then my dream ended that's all that's all i got oh i he looked across i looked across the field and i could see the sun coming up on the other side and a grove of trees so mm. i woke up and i told cynthia about it I was very excited that i had such a beautiful dream and then i realized my grandson isaiah looked a lot like him so I went and I got the period clothes. I got Isaiah posed out in the field. And uh, um, oh, and after the dream, and I posed Isaiah immediately, I did that drawing so that I could lock in my head what Joseph looked like, you know? But I didn't forget. It was very clear still. The dream did not fade through the whole time I was working on the painting. And then the really interesting thing happened when I was working on the painting. I almost got, I was getting to the point where I was just down to Joseph's face. And I wanted it to look like the face in my dream and not like Isaiah. And on the drawing that you can see there on the screen, I used the Isaiah, but I used the death mask uh, that I have of Joseph to get the cheek. Uh, bones higher and he has a had a real prominent cheek that's set back 
And so I tried to get those features of, the, of a young boy feature. But I didn't want it to look like Isaiah in the painting. I wanted it to look like my dream. And I could not get it. It just kept, every time I kept trying to go at it, it would start to fail. And then, you know, and with watercolor, when you bring that up, you only have one chance. Because if you, uh, if you, every brush stroke is permanent, you know, so if that eye goes in wrong or the nose is not quite right, you're just out of luck. And I've been on this painting for uh, almost two months. And so I was starting to panic and get really, uh, like I'd ruined the painting. And every night I'd say to Cynthia, I've ruined it. And she goes, no, you have it. You'll fix it tomorrow. No, you won't. Well, the next day I was downstairs in the studio, really frustrated about things. And I was just sitting and I was looking through YouTube. You know how you flip through it? And I came across the, a talk by Bruce R. McConkie. And at first I went, oh, I don't want to listen to McConkie right now. So I went past it. And then... Then I thought, no, you need to listen to that talk. So I went back and I listened to the talk. And this is so interesting because it's that talk, you know, it's uh, his is, it's uh, agency or inspiration, which is, and, uh, and he talked about that fine balance between agency and inspiration. And when you've done all that you can and you've exercised everything you possibly can, what do you do? And you can go to the Lord and ask for more. And, mm -hmm. and then expect more if you've put in all the efforts. So I, I did that. I, I did that. It, it took me three days to have confidence to do it. But it was really interesting how I, every brushstroke came and I had to approach it differently than I normally did. But eventually it, uh, it came and the painting looks just like what I saw in my dream. So wonderful. Mm. That is amazing. We're just looking for it right here. Okay, we're gonna share and show that. Beautiful, beautiful painting. So can you see him standing on that grassy knoll? Oh, yes. Can so, you see it too? Yeah, I can see it. Can everybody else see it? Okay. I think so. Um, yes. see, the, see the weeds where he's standing? They're all kind of broken and walked on. And I've, I've done that on purpose. So he's looking off to where the sun's coming up. He's on his way to the grove. Mm -hmm. And I've made the grass and everything on this, on his side of the water that runs through the St. Grove area, uh, all broken and trampled like he's maybe been there before. And everything on the other side is, is upright and like it's not been traveled through. So everything on the other side of the ditch is going to be new for him. And, and uh, his life's going to change and all of ours will. Mm. Well, I love how you have captured the appropriate season. So often we see the sacred grove in summer. Yes. And it wasn't. It was cold. Well, it could have even been snow on the ground. There's a report mm -hmm. in upstate New York uh, the week before. So. Oh, the amazing. Just love this painting, but love the beautiful message that Joseph was an inquirer after truth. But he had to prepare himself. We know that he read the scriptures. He prepared, he pondered, he prayed and prepared for this first prayer vocally. And the way you prepared for this painting was to do everything you could to prepare yourself in every way. And then when all those doors were shut to turn to Heavenly Father and receive such inspiration. I will mm -hmm. never look at this painting without knowing that lesson in my life. <laughs> that Heavenly Father's there to add to our efforts and give us the strength we need to accomplish what we have before us. Just exactly what Joseph needed to know. 
And at least to the other magnificent paintings that we love so much, which happen to also be same kind of a message on this 23rd day of July. Because let's look at a couple of the pioneer paintings that you've done. I mean, you have painted more consistently than anyone I've ever seen the wonderful historical sites and places of church history. And to get it right. We're gonna find it. There's Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, here we go. There we go. Can you see that one, Al? Not um, yet. Tell no. me which one. No. Yeah, I, I have to go in just from there to get back into it. I guess. Okay, we're going. Okay, we're gonna try one more time here. <laughs> And I think it is just so wonderful how you have your entire studio, um, all of your paintings available, not just for purchase, but to um, to enjoy. I mean, you can click on a collection and um, let's see if we can just get that bigger and move it over. Yeah, that looks like you're trying to pull up. Uh, there we go. Can you see it now? Yes. Try all of the last two. Yes. Yeah. This seems like such a similar message. Tell us about this girl and your desire to paint her the way you did. Well, this is a painting uh, of Mary Goble Pay. And she was uh, Sister Hinckley's uh, grandmother. And I didn't, uh, this, um, this was part of, there was a documentary by Lee Groberg that he filmed on the Martin and Willie Handcart Company. And he invited artists to be up on the set. And we were up there and it was 50 degrees below zero. And, yeah. <laughs> and there's no way you could draw. I mean, you'd just be shaking your hands and everything. You couldn't draw them. So, and sometimes my camera wouldn't even work. It was so cold. And, um, but as I was driving home in between shoots, I had this image come in to my mind of this young girl standing all by herself at the top of a hill. And so um, at the next shoot they had, I tried to uh, find uh, models and things like that for me that I could uh, put together to try to match um, my image of this girl that I could see in my head. And I didn't, at the time, I didn't know it, uh, anything about Mary. It was not until later. But the interesting experience I had while I was drawing it was I was, of course, drawing out the figure and the hand card in pencil on paper and trying to figure out how tall, what color hair, you know, just uh how big the figure would be on a uh on a hand cart you know on a historical hand cart size and so i kind of got as i was drawing things out i would hear this voice in my head say uh no 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 i would never stand like that no no my uh i would never have that look on my face and i just sort of thought i was talking to myself you know how you do and so i would change my drawing and i would uh, be listening to this inner voice right and uh when i was almost finished with the painting uh, a client came over and looked at it and he's he said let me tell you who this is and it's fit i mean it fit the personality of mary global pay perfectly wow. and and after I had finished the painting, I realized that it was probably Mary. She was pretty stubborn, but very loving and happy person. And uh, she was writing in her diary about what things that she was going to do when she got to Salt Lake instead of 15 people died last night. There's no way we're going to make it. And my feet are killing me because she ended up having to have her toes amputated. From the from frostbite once she got into Salt Lake, 
But the most interesting thing about I learned from this painting was the, this painting is symbolic when you're trudging up a hill and nothing is going right. And for Mary, nothing was going right. I mean, she's losing, she's going to lose her mother and I think three siblings. And she had done nothing wrong, right? She had committed herself and she was going to go and it was the right thing to do. And yet nothing was going right. So she's get, gotten to the top of the hill and she's looking forward and saying, uh, and seeing a hundred more miles of hills ahead. So what's the look on your face? And Mary was only 13. And you know, you know, when you ask a 13 year old to make their bed, what's the look you get? <laughs> and and uh, so the look on her face is really important. And she's willing to do it. She's willing to move forward. She's not particularly happy about it, but she's going to do it. And she ends up coming to Salt Lake and having her toes amputated and living a life of happiness. And her grandkids never even knew that she had known that her toes had been amputated. They, they told me that they ran in on her one day and she was soaking her feet in a pail of water. And that was the first time that they realized that uh, grandma didn't have toes. So, uh, you know, a, a life of, could have been a life of tragedy, but she just like looked forward. And this is what's so fun about being an artist, is the, you know, by the, the work I have to do and the thought process and the thinking and the study through a painting teaches me so many things about um, my own life. And even with the watercolors, you know, because I, watercolor, you can't, um, you can't go back. You can't fix things from the past. If you have horrible major mistakes, you have to start over. You have to start over. And with a fresh, clean piece of paper and, and things come quickly because you've already done a lot of but uh, oil painting, you push and you do, and you cover up and you scrape off. and You're just always messy. But the process I have to go through to make the watercolor work really is a, quite a spiritual process. It's been a great blessing to my life. And to so many and to all of others us. That's right. worldwide. I would love to just show, and thank you for sharing all that. Um, I just want to show a little bit of a collection that um, is one of the many that Al has made possible online for you to just enjoy. Okay. Oh, excuse that. Okay, let's try that one more time and see if that will come up. Share audio. Um, yeah. Collections. Share. Is that showing oh, yet? Oh. So you can't see that, Al? So for some reason that is not showing, but you can open up any of his collections, the temples, the pioneers, the New York upstate, worldwide, um, different areas. It, it's just incredible. Do you have a favorite painting, Al, or collection? What, what do you think is your best work or just something you love the most? Um, probably the painting, I probably have 10 pieces that I have in my home that I surround me with that uh, are my favorites. They, but they're not necessarily my best paintings. They are the paintings I've learned the most from, mm. and uh, and speak to me. So when I walk past them, they say, you know, like the Mary Goble painting. It's like 
I walk past that and they go, okay, you, when I have an issue, I always walk past that and say, mm -hmm. okay. And, uh, but probably a painting called My Father's House. Uh, it's pretty close to my very favorite. Uh, it's a painting of the Garden of Gethsemane, looking the view the Savior would have had, looking across to uh, the temple and uh, what's going to be happening, you know, in a short time period. Truman Madsen helped me with the painting. Um, uh, Dan Hone uh, was, and they, bo they both helped me there in Jerusalem, and Madsen helped me a lot with that painting. Too. And uh, so it's historically accurate, and uh, I just love it. I love the, the view. If you look it up and, uh, and imagine yourself being the savior, and uh, watching the soldiers come up to you and waiting for them to come. And uh, that's one of the beautiful things I think about that painting. It's him waiting. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just exactly what you said about the wonderful work with watercolor and how it relates to our lives and how we can't go back and fix the past, but the Savior can help us move forward and correct things that we've done and help us to learn the lessons we need to learn and somehow what the pioneers knew to move forward to keep going one step after another and find the amazing joy that's there for us to have you're such an example of that amen and what a perfect day to have you as we're celebrating the entry of the pioneers to the the valley here in salt lake and and Utah wasn't so like then exactly, <laughs> but to be celebrating that and to, to know that there are all of these beautiful paintings that you have given the world that can exactly, like you just said, inspire every time you walk by. I know we feel that way about your artwork in our home and we're so appreciative. Um, everybody said that they could see that um, Collection. Collection. So we're going to just do a, a few more little pictures before we end here. And then if there's anything else you want to add, we'll do that. Okay. And on and on. And it's so beautiful. I hate to turn that <laughs> off. It even had your beautiful painting of our hometown of Bluffdale. And I thought ending on the celebration with the beautiful flag on the temple is perfect for today. So thank you again.
And please share this. Let people know what a gift Al Rounds is to the world. And what a message his artwork gives to all of us. Thanks, Al, so much. Hope you have a wonderful weekend and yes, a great celebration. Do. Thank you for being with us. And we leave this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Amen. Savior. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Al. Thank you, my friends.